These heads, human heads, hang on the veranda of a dark longhouse far up the river eye in the interior of Sarawak in Borneo. Chieftain Jim Boone, like all other darks, is no longer a headhunter, though during his youth he did take heads. He's carrying one now. Heads like this, taken in the past, still have meaning for the modern darks. They're an echo of their history and part of their beliefs today. The bundle in front of his belt contains his magic charms, a boar's tusk, sacred stones, and other objects of pagan magic. He straps on his sword. His hands are tattooed. Only a man who had taken heads was in the old days allowed that privilege. He's making an individual, a personal offering to one of the heads he took himself. It's an offering to the past, to the past beliefs of the darks, beliefs that are changing. He pours out drinks to the spirits and drinks himself. He makes offerings of food, plates of rice, eggs and vegetables are set out. This is a ceremony to propitiate the spirits. The spirits are generally thought of as living in the sky. They're symbols of birds, the hawk, the hornbill, the woodpecker. He puts the offering out in the open. He covers it with a cloth so that he can't be seen from below, but can be seen by the birds of omen in the sky above. A longhouse is really a village. Maybe a whole day's journey from one longhouse to the next. As many as 30 or 40 families may live under a single roof. The whole building is raised off the ground on stilts as a protection against snakes, scorpions and floods and also to prevent the domestic pigs from getting in. At each end is a single log ladder and inside take place all the activities of ordinary village life. This woman is carrying her child down to the river. Children amongst the darks are carried for two or three years and suckled for even longer than that. The longhouse is always built beside a river. The rivers are the chief means of getting about in this huge wild country. And they're also used for collecting water, bathing, doing the laundry, any other domestic things. As far up the river as this, there aren't any crocodiles, though lower down there are. And so the people, while they're bathing, they're perfectly safe. Felling the jungle is the first stage in producing the annual crop of rice. For nothing is more important in dark life than rice. Each stage, felling the jungle, sowing the seed and reaping the harvest, is celebrated with a religious festival. This work of clearing is done commonly. All the men of the longhouse join in. The farms eventually will be tended and cared for by individual families. Each year, new areas of jungle are cleared, and at the end of each season, the old farms are left to revert to the jungle. And they may be left to lie fallow for 10 or 20 years. After cutting comes the burning of the felled trees. In a country as wet as Borneo, it's difficult to get the timber and scrub dry enough to set it alight. It obviously depends on a spell of dry weather, which is largely a matter of luck. Or, as the dogs prefer to think of it, of having the spirits on their side. The whole success of a crop depends on having a good burn. This family clearing of about 10 acres has had a fairly good burn. 
so that at once the planting can begin. Again, it's a communal effort and the whole longhouse joins in. The men walk in front, driving their long poles into the ground. It's called dibbling. They're making holes for the rice grains. A difficult job through all the half-burnt litter of branches and scrub that have been left lying about. The women follow, flicking in rice grains, flipping them very skillfully into the holes. It needs a trained hand, and it's surprising how very rarely they miss. However far the rice fields are from the village, and it may be ten miles, in the evening they all make their way home down the river. For miles the rivers may be calm and placid, then suddenly break into fierce rapids. are very excitable people. Here's a man dancing in the boat out of sheer exuberance. Often they leap overboard into really dangerous water for no apparent reason. Every year, boats upset or crash into the rocks and people get drowned. There are whirlpools and strong undertows, and the river here is probably 10 or 20 feet deep. It doesn't seem to worry them as they go yelling and shouting with delight. in the longhouse, the old women spend much of their time setting out the rice to dry on the wide veranda that's specially constructed for the purpose. They must spread it quite thinly to let the sun get at it. Otherwise, the rice would soon be spoilt in a very damp climate like Borneo. The chickens can get at it too, and another job for the old women is to scare the chickens off. The dried grain is then pounded by the young women. The object is to get the husk off, otherwise it simply couldn't be eaten. Some prefer to grind it. Then the rice is taken out of the mortar by hand. Rice is eaten three or even four times a day. Alone it would be dull. And many of the jungle vegetables are collected to go with it. One of the most popular of these are bamboo shoots, which grow wild all over Borneo. The fresh shoot of a young tree like this makes a delicious vegetable, either raw or cooked. The outside skin has to be trimmed off, and the heart tastes rather like uh, asparagus. The river has fish, the jungle its game. Cooking is easy, even in the open. You chop off a section of, of bamboo, and then you chop up some of the food on leaves and sprinkle salt all over it. You stuff the food into the bamboo and simply put it on the fire. The green bamboo doesn't burn, but the food gets nicely cooked.
The Daleks are one of the few people in Southeast Asia who can make all their own clothing, and they specialize in ceremonial blankets. They start off by collecting various leaves, either pineapple leaves, or certain kind of palms, such as you see here, and this little girl is putting the leaf out in the river to get it clean. Meanwhile, her elder sister is preparing the dye. And her mother is stripping down some leaf that's already been cleaned with a fine wooden comb. The dye comes from the bark of a tree. The soft part of the leaf is being combed out, leaving just the strong threads behind. The dye must be mixed carefully. Most of the women can weave, although it's a highly skilled job. And here's one beginning to get a pattern going before she puts it onto the big loom. Now some strands are being prepared, dyed red, and they'll be dried out in the sun. These strands will be used for tying patterns into the woven material by a method that's known as ikat. In ikat, you dip the whole cloth in sequences, part, a part of it blocked off each time into different colors to get the pattern. It's a very difficult, complicated business. The weaver puts over her back a kind of halter, which enables her to pull the whole loom tight while she goes on working with her hands, throwing the shuttle from left to right. This is the result. This is a ceremonial blanket. It's very thick, almost as thick as tweed, and extremely strong. This is a traditional old design that has human headhunting associations. Nowadays, as you can see, new designs are creeping in. Someone seems to have seen a picture of the trooping of the color. Aeroplanes, too, are becoming symbols to replace the hawk and the hornbill as all-seeing eyes. The favorite dark sport is cockfighting. Here, the boys are only letting them spar. In a real fight, the cocks have huge, long, vicious spurs put on them, and they fight to the death. Being masculine and beautiful is very important amongst the Dyaks, especially the men. They're extremely vain, and I suppose they have more time to spare in beautifying themselves than, than the women. They do their hair in very elaborate, complicated styles, sometimes they take hours to complete. The whole body is decorated with all, all signs of um, tattooed patterns. It may take a man as much as 10 or 15 years to get the whole set complete. The patterns are put on with a stencil cut out of dried leaf. Ink is made from soot and pounded leaf and then smeared over the stencil. It's pushed down onto the arm so that the pattern comes out on the flesh. This is quite difficult when the arm is round and the stencil is flat. Parts of the pattern that fail to come out clearly are touched up with a small brush. The stuff he's putting on is mainly soot, which has to be banged and tapped through the skin exactly along the line of the design. Now the tattooer is tapping over the whole pattern with a thorn needle dipped into ink. He's tapping just strongly enough to break the skin and allow the ink to penetrate. The position of tattooing on the body has its own significance. 
having your throat tattooed is one of the earliest marks of dark manhood. This can be really very painful. <laughs> In this case, the stencil can't be fitted onto the throat, and the pattern has to be drawn by hand. There are literally dozens of old traditional designs a Dayak man can choose from. Although well, they may not look like it, they're all derived from animals or plants. Often designs like this one will tell a story of a journey into the interior, or a successful adventure, or a year's work in some other part of Borneo. The whole longhouse turns out when there's a trial or a dispute. Here's a man who can't settle his argument. It immediately becomes a matter for everybody in the longhouse, everybody's entitled to have their say, join in the argument. This is the other contestant in the case. It's more than a trial by jury, it's trial by the whole community. These discussions can go on for hours and hours, but they do usually reach a decision in the end. If a man has broken the customary law, then he's fined. Or if a man, as here, is having a dispute about who owns a piece of jungle, then usually there's agreement in the end. they can't reach agreement, then the old traditional method was to hold a trial by water. Here's one of the contestants being prepared by the chief to see how long he can stay under water, and here's the other. For them, it's a serious matter. So each man has got to have an elder, an expert person, looking after him to see that he doesn't drown himself. Whoever stays under water longest is believed to be in the right. He wins the case. They start the test. He's hanging on to the stick for dear life. This man has stayed underwater for so long that his friends have to drag him out of the water, lug him onto the beach to try to revive him. And the other fellow? He's all right, he's the winner. He's proved his case. Rice in the jungle clearings takes about six months to ripen. Then the families turn out to harvest it. They cut off only the ears with tiny knives. With luck, there'll be enough food for the whole of next year, four times a day. If there's not enough, it'll be near disaster. But this year, there's been a good harvest and everybody's delighted. Rice is carried in these big baskets, which carry about 80 pounds, to be stored in rice huts and taken out when it's needed in the longhouse. The entrance to the rice hut is guarded by a scarecrow, just as much to keep away the evil spirits as to keep away rats and birds. 
The rice harvest is followed by a great festival and religious ceremony. This year, the sacred hornbill has been made part of the ceremony because the chieftain had a dream ordering him, him to do so. The hornbill is hoisted to the top of a high post. In the old days, this was only done to welcome returning headhunters. To the darks, the hornbill represents strength and power. It's the biggest and loudest bird in the jungle. They regard it as their own ancestor, Buran Kenyalang, who started the dark race about 28 generations ago. The aeroplane is beginning to replace the uh, Kenyalang as a symbol of power. This is an occasion when everybody gets dressed up. This little girl has found my film pack has another use. This is a chance for the women to beautify themselves as elaborately as their menfolk. Strings of silver dollars are hung round this girl's waist. This lovely headdress is supported by a cane interior frame hung all around with red, black, yellow and orange beads. These bangles are made of silver. are treasured possessions carefully preserved for these feast days. When everybody's ready, they go down to welcome the guests coming in from other longhouses. The men carry shotguns to welcome them with bursts of fire and the women beat gongs to prevent the, over, the omen birds from hearing any disrespectful remarks that the children may make. The guests are on their way. And they bring with them, of course, their fighting cocks. It may take several days of traveling along a river like this for neighbors to arrive at the scene of the party. off the evil spirits. The celebrations begin with the elders moving slowly round the longhouse veranda. They chant supplications to the spirits of the great hornbill and the sacred paddy. Again, noise is important in attracting the good spirits and driving away the unwelcome ones. of these kind of ceremonies. First of all, they pour spirits to the, to the other kind of spirits, and then every guest is given a drink. All dark ceremonies are liable eventually to develop into very heavy drinking parties.
moments of gaiety and moments of seriousness. This is serious again, as one of the elders circles all the guests present with a sacrificial cockerel. Again, it's to propitiate the spirits. Eggs, rice, a little drink are put out as offerings, and the old man gives thanks for the good harvest and prays for the same again next year. Dancing plays an important part in every festival of this kind. And the idea behind it is still headhunting. And this man is going through the formal motions of fighting with a sword. Anywhere else, the children like to imitate their elders and make fun of the serious. The children are left very much to themselves. They spend most of their time playing about, and when they do this, they do it with tremendous vigor. They throw themselves into it without restraint. They play their games hard, at times dangerously hard. And although they often hurt themselves quite badly, you never hear them cry. It's the same in the river. They don't just swim or float. They hurl themselves about as though they were really enjoying it. I think that the old ex-headhunter Jim Boone would approve of this. The boys are learning to be tough, brave Dyaks.